With two console videos in the bag for Battlefield 6, we already know the general score. A game that is well received and performs well at 60 FPS in the console space. On PC though, you have a range of settings and getting the best out of them is not exactly straightforward given the amount of them and how nested this options menu really is. Thankfully with comparisons to the PS5 version and some side by sides between the settings, we can work out those settings which are best for the fastest and most fluid frame rate experience while keeping the game looking alright for multiplayer. And that is what this video is about today, a run through of those most important settings for optimized play on mid to low spec PCs. Getting right into it, the optimized settings I will be showcasing in this video have been worked out by DF contributor Rayan. He's helped us out in the past and does great work, and these settings were derived on an 8GB RTX 3070 at 1440p running at native resolution DLAA. Let's start with those most intensive settings and work our way down. Now the first setting to worry about is sun shadow quality. As we can see here, the game offers an overkill setting on the far right that is wasteful, even on high-end GPUs. It does not offer a transformational quality uplift like a ray-traced alternative would, and instead just ups that shadow map resolution at the cost of performance. On ultra overkill, you're getting visuals similar to high, yet high will run 18% better while looking similar. Medium is 24% faster, but noticeably degraded. Here I'm going to split my optimized settings for this video. I recommend high for GPUs of 3070 level and above, and medium for GPUs that are less capable than that. Here for the PS5, the devs make a similar choice, with the custom setting where its resolution quality is between medium and high, and the performance mode has PCF filtering turned off. Next up, ambient occlusion and screen space GI. Here I prefer the results of SGS GI in this game as the SSAO black halo visuals look bad and ancient honestly, but the cost is high for SSGI in comparison. In which case I recommend a splitting of settings again. Low optimized settings should use GTAO set to low, while upper end GPUs can use SSGI set to low to avoid that Far Cry 3 SSAO halo look. The base PS5 appears to be using GTAO, apparently set to low here. After these two most important settings, the rest of the tweaks will be more minor but will add up in aggregate. First let's start with volumetric quality. This adjusts the quality of the fog in the game. High improves performance by 3% for little loss in quality, while low has an obvious quality loss for a 5% frame rate improvement. I'll split the settings again here with lower GPUs using low and higher ones using high. Here the PS5 performance setting uses the low setting as found on PC, while the balanced mode targets the high setting. Next is screen space reflections. Here going down to low offers a minimal quality loss at times next to high, but with a helpful 4% performance increase. Here I recommend the low setting, which mirrors what consoles do, apparently running at the low setting as found on PC. After this you have local lights and shadows. The setting does a few things. First it'll call shadow casting lights from some lights, like here getting rid of the flashlight light on the low setting. Next it will change the range at which some shadows draw, like here we can see on the high setting we're moving it backwards and forward, causes the shadow of your character to draw, and then cut off depending upon the distance from the originating light source. This behavior does not happen on the overkill setting. Here based upon shadow behavior, both PS5 modes appear to be using the high setting. In spite of a slight performance win for low, I recommend the high setting. The last most significant GPU setting is mesh quality. This setting changes the quality of meshes at a distance, leading to more obvious pop-in as you move through the world. This does have a GPU limited performance difference, which means you'll want to be moving this down to high for high-end optimized settings. For lower-end GPUs here, I will recommend the low setting. After this setting, many of the other settings only offer smaller GPU related performance differences. And the most important things to now target is CPU performance or VRAM performance. A good example of CPU performance targeting would be looking at the high fidelity objects amount setting. This reduces the animation of objects and removes effects outright at a distance. As we can see here in the campaign footage, the medium and low setting gets rid of the water splash as this vehicle drives by, while the low setting reduces quality further by getting rid of animation on the tires, which stops spinning. Here the high setting retains all those animations and effects, but gets rid of them at a distance, like here in this scene where the car on high lacks smoke behind it that is there on ultra. Here the PS5 performance mode appears to be using the medium setting, while the balanced mode appears to be using high. My settings will reflect that, medium for the lower optimized settings and high for the higher ones. The most important VRAM related setting is unsurprisingly texture quality. 
Here there is no noticeable difference in texture quality that I could find between high, ultra, and overkill, while going to low shows clear differences. Nonetheless, we can measure upticks in VRAM occupancy by going above high even if visuals are not noticeably improving. Here I would imagine lower settings here increase the amount of active streaming. Compared to PS5, we can see the PS5 performance mode uses the low setting, while balanced is presumably using something like high. Here based upon our testing, 8GB GPUs should not use the ultra or overkill setting, and instead use high. Ultra is better suited for 12GB GPUs. All in all, the optimized settings look like this between low and high variants. Some smaller nips and tucks here, but generally this game will look pretty similar between the lowest settings and its maximum ones due to the lack of upper end scaling in this game. In total, in RTX 3070, using the high optimized settings like in this scene here, we can see a 72% overall performance uplift. This takes the 3070 from being sub-60 to being healthily above it at 1440p DLAA. And the biggest visual difference between the two sides here is just the ambient occlusion type. It just goes to show how plateaued rasterization effects can be at higher sampling counts. Using the lower end version of optimized settings, I loaded up the game's multiplayer at 1440p DLSS quality mode on an RTX 4060 to check out how things ran. Based upon my experience playing multiple matches, with an RTX 4060, I would say that GPU will spend most of its time at these settings between 90 and 100 FPS, with only the densest areas and combat filled moments bringing it down into the low 80s. This is an excellent VRR experience actually, as long as your processor can hold up under the pressure of a 64 player match, and the 9800X3D I was using, of course, left the GPU unconstrained and it passed the test with flying colors. This CPU had zero issues with combat or traversal and had zero frame time issues based upon the game's internal frame time metrics where the CPU was never the limiting factor in performance, rather the GPU always was. That is good to see, but this is also one of the best gaming CPUs out there. Utilizing the same settings and dropping that 4060 into a Ryzen 5 3600 showed a different level of performance. Running uncapped on those same maps and in conquest mode, GPU limited frame rates would be between 90 and 100 FPS, but frame time health was worse. One only needs to look at the frame time graph to see this. Check out me in combat here on the 9800X3D. Nice and smooth GPU limited frame times there. On the Ryzen 5 3600 in similar scenarios, as we can see here, the frame time graph is much spikier even though the frame rate is not all that much lower. The VRR experience would not be awful necessarily, but it would be less than ideal. The biggest issue is in variability of the performance overall. On this Ryzen 5 3600, the CPU limited frame rate can dip down into the upper 60s at worst I have found. Following the in-game metrics, you can see that the GPU in this scene is capable of 100 FPS, but the Ryzen 5 3600 is going to be holding it back to the 70s or potentially lower. For consistency reasons, I would recommend lower end processors use a frame rate cap. After playing multiple rounds with a frame rate cap, done via VSync to 60Hz, I saw zero frame rate drops the entire gameplay over many hours. That is great to see. It is a very smooth 60 FPS even in the most hectic moments, and I recommend CPUs of this lower level and lower core count to use FPS caps to keep frame times consistent, because if you don't, you can start seeing issues. What I mean by that is if you use an unlocked frame rate on a low-end CPU like this, you can see issues that you would otherwise not see with a frame rate cap enabled. A good example with that is frame time spikes. On the 9800X3D, I saw zero frame time spikes, even on my first playthrough with a fresh shader cache. On the Ryzen 5 3600, this was not the case. Occasionally, when a new effect like an explosion would occur in front of me, I could see a frame time spike to around 50 milliseconds. It almost presents like a shader compilation stutter would, and it might be. While this game does have a shader compilation step, I think it may be partially incomplete and instead uses some asynchronous compilation for those shaders that are not as a part of that pre-compilation step. On a CPU like the 9800X3D, it has enough threads and headroom with a GPU like the RTX 4060 to have no frame time detriments while running unlocked. But on the 3600, which is already tapped out by gameplay code, an unlocked frame rate causes frame time spikes occasionally the first time you see something new. You can avoid this with a frame rate cap. 
To test this, I deleted the shader cache everywhere it is found on the PC and let the game recompile a fresh set of new shaders, thus still presumably with a number missing. With this fresh shader cache, I did not leave the frame rate unlocked, rather I settled for a 60 FPS lock. And even when playing new maps for the first time and seeing new effects for the first time, I saw zero issues and zero frame time spikes. Just a flat, totally locked 60. The lesson I want to impart here is if you are on a lower end processor and if your game is having issues with frame time spikes, you should look to implement a frame rate cap that is appropriate to the lowest average frame rate you tend to see. If a game is doing a lot in parallel and leveraging as many CPU cycles as it possibly can, that can lead to contention at unlocked frame rates, where frame time behavior is worse because resources are scant, and frame rate capping can avoid that issue. Coming to the end of this video, I want to talk a bit about the general experience on PC briefly and mention some bugs, as I had a lot of them, surprisingly. Often while playing, the depth of field on the rear view model would expand greatly and cover the entire gun and hands and the entire world a few meters in front of my character, leading it to be hard to see. An even worse graphical bug I had was when all the lighting and textures loaded incorrectly on a map, and this caused HDR Bloom to take over the whole image, just completely broken visuals. Given how short a time in total I was playing the game, I saw very many visual bugs during that time, and I would say this game needed more time in the oven before launch. Another issue I saw was on the Ryzen 5 3600 while playing Unlocked. A handful of times while getting into a server, there would be a frame time spike every 5 seconds, cyclically. This made the game unplayable. Even after leaving the server, this frame time spike would not stop, and kept occurring in the menus even. Only shutting down the game and restarting it would eliminate the issue. So I would say the game does lack some polish at launch in the visuals and performance department. The last thing I want to mention is the graphical experience. I was having a fine enough time playing the game, I guess, but it is hard not to be disappointed about the graphical presentation here. As Oliver mentioned in his videos, the lighting quality does leave much to be desired, and objects just kind of appear to float in the game. And given the lack of reflection response across the whole title, the game looks very crunchy and driven by diffuse texture detail. Given how pioneering games like Battlefield 3, Battlefront, and Battlefield 5 were in the graphics department, this game is visually disappointing and kind of old looking. I expected better from the studio, basically. Anyway, if you found this video insightful and helpful, hit that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, help on Patreon. As always, this is Alex, bring you farewell, and auf Wiedersehen.